Hello, juniors. Today is uh, May 11th, and i um, going to start our last thought era this week. So the, th the thinking for me is this week we'll focus on the last thought era that I'll go over with you guys between today, May 11th, and the end of the week, like the 15th, 16th. Then the following week, I will post the final instructions for your final ESA, which will most likely be a final essay that by then your JRPs will be done. I, by the way, with the JRPs there, I have a couple people done. You're welcome to go ahead and check. If yours is not done, that means I didn't get to yours yet, but some people's are done and you can start reading them. The comments I made, and for those of you that didn't do well, you can rewrite them for those you did. Your grade is what it is. It's not going to go in the grade till probably Saturday, Sunday of this week, but I will post final instructions next week for your final essay, and you will have pretty much the week to turn it in, and then that's going to be the end. With the week after that, which is the last week of May, um, being open for students that want to go back and change some things that they failed, some select ESAs, not all of them. But anyways, so the last one, American Modernism. American Modernism? Turn of the century, so it started around 1900s and it ended around 1950, which is when postmodernism comes in, which is another thought era, but we're not going to go into that one because we don't have time. American modernism is a time of contrast as America emerges, as America emerges and grows. Okay, so remember realism we just finished with to build a fire and Mark Twain's essay, The Lowest Animal. But realism began to get old because these new technologies emerged and these new ideas emerged. And American authors and artists started to convey disillusionment with traditions that seem spiritually empty, like going to church or like worshiping uh, one God. Those seems or things like that seemed very out of touch at the time, especially because of uh, one specific thing that happened, you can already see on the left over here. Um, they re our new authors at the time rejected traditional themes and styles, rejected traditional ways to write and to represent what they knew American, the typical American was going through. And they finally, number three, they wanted bold experimentation in all artistic areas. Um, the contributing factor, one of the contributing factors, just like in realism with civil with the Civil War, in the case of modernism, World War One or the Great War, was one of the biggest factors to how Americans started to think about where they were headed in the new part of the world in the 19, 1900s. They saw disillusionment because of the casualties, how many people were dying, but they also saw such improvements in technology like machine guns and, and flying in and airplanes, things like that started to change the way Americans viewed themselves and, and the future too. Do you remember the American dream we talked about when we started the year? We started talking about the city on a hill, the new Eden that the, the Puritans, that John Winthrop saw. They remember thought that there were boundless resources and opportunities in a land that was barely populated. There was no such thing as a cap on progress. You could do whatever you want. You can go west. You can cultivate land. You can own your own land. You can create your own business. The independent, self-reliant person will always succeed. Those things in the early part of the, the nation's birth, they weren't so much the, the same or true in the 1900s. Some begin to wonder if in the early 1900s if this is still true. And this is reflected in the literary era, literary works of this era. Like Richard Corey, this poem by Edwin Arlington Robinson. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from head from sole to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said, Good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. 
In time, we thought that he was everything to make us they wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the f light and went without the mood, the meat, sorry, and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. A uh, poem like that makes you think that people, when they were writing the stuff like this, were make, making other Americans think that it's a different kind of world that we're entering in. Um, there was a time of contrast, too, in the 1900s. So you had such improvements like the Empire State Building, such huge, huge tasks and big buildings like the Empire State Building and the Golden Gate Bridge that were contrasted with things like the Great Depression when the market crashed and we had up to 24% unemployment, which in some ways is kind of like what we're going through right now, but we don't have, I think we're at 14% unemployment right now. Um, but out of the Great Depression came many great public services, bridges, parks, libraries, thousands of miles of roads were funded by the New Deal. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt was right. Recovery would arrive in the 40s. Writers are now coming from all regions in the 1900s, in the 1920s and 30s. Not just New England. It used to be in the all the 1800s, all the famous writers were from, from the area, from the Northeast. But they were starting to come from everywhere. Another group of writers became become expatriates, preferring life on the French Riviera. The attractions for expatriate lifestyle were... No prohibition. They could drink all they want. Because remember at that time, this is when we started reading Gatsby. There was no there was no alcohol allowed until we had an amendment for it. There was cheaper cost of living. There was more grace, more luxury. And it seemed exotic and much less stifling than in America where everybody was working to death. Gertrude Stein, a famous literary central figure of modernism, coined the expatriate writers like Ernest Hemingway, who you see on the left there, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and T.S. Eliot as the lost generation. These authors celebrated in both America and Europe were drinking buddies with musicians like Cole Porter and Pablo Picasso, the famous artist. This environment leads to an explosion of creativity and cynicism about America. They don't just write about America. They talk about how incredibly... Disillusion they are. Disillusionment means like you're just like, you have no emotion. You have no emotion towards a certain subject. You kind of feel like, not like you're dead inside. That's a little extreme, but close to that. And in some ways they challenge that. So those ideas are still inspiring modern artists today. Like the movie Midnight in Paris and who you see here is supposed to be the guy who wrote the Great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife, Zelda Fitzgerald. But uh, out of the movements also came from modernism. One of the movements that came from modernism was the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was in Harlem, a borough of New York, where black people from all walks of life felt that they were bound by similar cultural values. Harlem Renaissance was a title retroactively applied to the burgeoning growth of black literature, theater, and other art forms that began during the 20s. It was a rallying cry against racism, and it was sort of the seeds for the revolution of the civil rights movement. And there were such ardor authors like Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes being one of the famous, one, famous ones, and they would all get together at the Cotton Club in Harlem, and they would talk, and they would perform, and they would become... It became sort of the cool hangout place that sort of took off, and everyone from there wanted to mimic the Harlem Renaissance, at least in black communities nationwide. But they were trying to find out where they were going to go as far as a new identity and figuring out their new their new role. Um, and so for today, I just want to wrap up with reading one of the poems by Langston Hughes. He's one of the famous authors of the Harlem Renaissance, who was very popular at the time. He also went, was an expatriate. So the Harlem Renaissance, so you don't have to do an assignment today, but I will. I want you to compare this to a Tupac song tomorrow. Sorry, something's in my mouth. 
I, too, is the name of the poem you can see on the right, right here. I, too, sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to the eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. So, again, it's a time and period that can be seen as a rebirth of African-American arts and culture, a significant part of American history in which the feelings and ideas of African-Americans first surfaced into mainstream culture and were recognized. Access to media gave people the voice to express themselves and their needs and wants. The parallels and contrasts between the Harlem Renaissance and hip-hop are telling of what remains constant through the times and what has changed in the last 100 years. Harlem in the early 20th century was the cultural magnet of the black world, which brought a treasure of influential artifacts. Similarly, hip-hop has become a dominant global force that will shape the future of the world. Yeah. In both, we see that people will work for improved conditions no matter what limitations are set upon them. While Langston Hughes remains one of the single most notable figures of the Harlem Renaissance, it is not as easy to attach such a label on a hip-hop artist. We're living in a day of hip-hop, and who will make the history books can't be predicted. It's hard to imagine that jazz would have had would have had been as loathed and feared and loved by the public as hip-hop is by some today. But perhaps in time, hip-hop will too gain similar acceptance. Tupac Shakur is one of the unique hip-hop artists who were known for both his authentic street persona and his sensitive artistic side. In his life, he had a career as both a rapper and an actor, and his style as a writer never strayed entirely from the poetic form. So tomorrow, I will share with you a Tupac song. You'll have to compare it to Langston Hughes. All right, guys, have a great day.